Alrighty, we're back. Your favorite podcast show of the week. This is Location Weekly. It's episode number 505, and we're recording live on February the 23rd. Abriana, how's life? How's things? Life is, is good. It's starting to warm up here, and I am appreciative of that so I can get outside and run or something. You know, I feel like I've been trapped in my bedroom for months. <laughs> yeah. How's it going up there? Well, you know, we, we had a super mild winter up until last week. Uh, well, it's still mild, actually, temperature wise, it's still mild, but we finally got some snow. So we've got a good, about a foot of snow, like three snowfalls cumulatively over the last week or so. Um, so I guess it's nice. I don't know. It's pretty. People like snow to look at. Um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty mild. It's, uh, you know, it's all melting away again. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful for a spring soon and things are starting to reopen here. From a COVID point of view, a lot of the uh, the businesses are being allowed to reopen at limited capacities and things like that. So, yeah, you know, things are things are moving. I think it's spring is coming. It's hopeful times, you know, and we'll see we'll see what happens. So, yeah, all all is well. I think we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. <sighs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, well, we've got four stories that we wanted to cover today. Some interesting things, um, some new technology, um, some old names coming back, uh, you know, into the uh, the forefront here. And uh, I'll let Ariana kick it off. All right. So this is interesting uh, story coming from Vodafone, and they're testing some new uh, new tracking level capabilities with centimeter level tracking. Uh, and they're partnering with a company called Sapcorda um, to test this technology. They recently just tested it, um, you know, saying that it can remotely track a vehicle, uh, you know, within 10 centimeters, which is, is pretty granular. Um, Sapcorda specializes in something called GNSS augmentation services. They're, they're out of Berlin and it's a joint venture that's um, created by Bosch, Geo++, uh, Mitsubishi Electric, and U-Blocks. Um, and so I was looking into what GNSS actually is, and um, it's it's something that it's another technology that works with GPS, um, but basically the uh, GNSS compatible equipment can be used can use like different navigational satellites um, from other networks beyond GPS. So obviously more satellites equal more uh, accuracy and reliability. So that's kind of what they're bringing to the table there. But Vodafone is really concentrating here on um, on autonomous vehicles, you know, within factories in particular, airports, dockyards, you know, anywhere that there's like heavy traffic and a lot of movement. Uh, but they can equip a number of vehicles with this built-in IoT SIM and then deliver this positioning data um, using the, what they call gigabit capable networks. Um, so during some of the testing that they did, they tested about uh, 100 kilometers combined of, of these vehicles. And, and um, they said that they were able to stay in their exact lane. They tested this during different, uh, different weather conditions. Um, and so, you know, the, the precise positioning service from Sapcorda will work alongside Vodafone for asset tracking, uh, fleet telematics, you know, and these are things that are installed in 54 countries right now. So I think this is good. You know, I always am excited to hear about any, uh, I don't know, any advances in something that would be like self-driving vehicles, like having young kids. I'm very hopeful for that. <laughs> Um, but I think obviously like for airports, factories, you know, dockyards, anything like that, that could be automated. Um, I think those are great places to start just because a lot of times you're, you're moving um, items and not people. Uh, so I think that it's like really good. You know, my question obviously is like, what does this mean for, uh, you know, for jobs and, and things of that nature as technology comes in, you know, jobs can move out. And I think of like here in Atlanta at the airport, you know, the thousands of people that are employed for driving luggage, you know, to and from the plane and, and doing all those things. And, um, you know, what does that look like for them? But I think that in a, you know, in a hopeful voice, it's like, Hey, this is some, some good advances that we're making here and, um, things that can just help us move, move quicker and more effectively. Um, so I like it. Yeah, I, I do too. And, and I think it's, um, 
you know, getting to that level of accuracy, 10 centimeters is like, to me, it's phenomenal, like that you can have that kind of precision now. And I think for vehicle and fleet tracking services and asset tracking, you know, this is an area where there's been a lot of innovation over the last number of years. You know, the the sort of GNS, GNSS system, I think is, um, you know, what most uh, sort of aircraft navigation, spacecraft navigation, you know, those kinds of things use. Uh, because, I, you know, if, if for those that aren't kind of like super versed in, in the world of satellites, you've got the GPS system, you know, which we all know and kind of our mobile devices use. And then you have sort of the GN, GNSS system, which really uh, the real difference there is the ability to sort of tap into the multiple international satellite networks out there to kind of have more precision. So, you know, obviously there's the US based satellite networks, uh, but then you have, you know, the Chinese have Baidu and you have uh, the GLONASS satellite network and, you know, the Russians run, the Indian, uh, um, you know, subcontinent has its own satellite system and so on. So it, it's it's the ability to sort of tap into these things from a navigation point of view at all, all together. Uh, to get that enhanced precision, right? And as opposed to just just the GPS uh, piece, which you know is is a component of that. Um, and so I, I think it's it, it's it blows my mind really that we can get to that level of accuracy. We've talked a lot about that uh, level of accuracy on indoor location, you know, beacons and Wi-Fi and magnetics and all that kind of stuff. And that makes sense to me, right? That you can you can have that level of accuracy with that kind of hardware. But when you're talking about satellites and getting this kind of precision. It's really interesting. I remember I was invited, gosh, must be five years ago to speak on a panel um, on Capitol Hill uh, at a, uh, a geo um, conference. And my co-panelists were this guy who came like, I don't even remember his name, but he was like a three star general in full like, you know, uh, uh, uniform. Um, some guy from uh, from NASA uh, who was one of their, you know, run their innovation team um and then there was like the moderator and and i'm the only guy there like out of the group that is basically able and and there to speak about consumer applications and and kind of you know how these satellites were going to be used for other things and everybody else there is in the room is like talking about military applications and all these other things and i remember the guy saying uh the the military commander saying he's like the next sort of wave and next generation of these satellites in terms of accuracy he goes when there's like an osama bin laden type of thing where we need to track down you know somebody we'll be able to actually drop the bomb and target you know the the you know the bomb to like his shirt pocket like that level of accuracy right like and i'm like that's crazy to me Right. But this is what they're thinking, like in that context. And we're sitting here in the marketing world and in the commercial world and sitting here going, yeah, but we can we can track assets and we can you know, we can move fleets and look at 10 centimeter accuracy. Right. So it's all relative. Right. Depending on who you are and kind of what your context is. But I think it's super interesting uh, that uh, that they're doing this. And, and I, I think there's a lot of applications for this kind of technology. So cool. All right, on to our second story. Now, this one is hits right at home. This is a story, uh, uh, full disclosure, I'm sharing about my my uh, startup over here uh, in Toronto called Ground Level Insights. Uh, we were in the news last week uh, because the government here uh, has uh, signed a partnership with us to deliver a pilot uh, project uh, with uh, one of the local municipal governments in the Toronto area, uh, the town of uh, Whitby. And essentially what we're doing is, is our platform is uh, really designed to help business owner operators understand uh, the human mobility, the foot traffic patterns around what's going on in their business, how many people are coming into their business, how often are those people there, where were they before, where did they go after they left, you know, kind of looking for those trends and those patterns, you know, that we kind of ingest a lot of location data and then kind of, you know, derive some insights from that with our um, machine learning algorithms and so on. And then we layer on top of that some other, um, you know, sensor-based technology. So, you know, we've got sensors for counting the actual foot traffic as it crosses through the door. We've got video analytics technologies we can use to uh, understand, um, you know, uh, are people properly uh, social distancing inside of a building? You know, are they wearing their face masks or not? We can detect those things using video analytics. 
And the same video analytics we can look at for demographic profiles of age and gender and so on of what's going on. So we kind of wrap that all together in a platform that we call the Ground Level uh, Insights Audience Platform. And so the town of Whippies basically rolled this out and we're kind of piloting this with 20 uh, businesses in the downtown core of the town. Um, and it's really interesting to me because the variety of businesses that we're rolling this out in, you know, is quite diverse. You've got, you know, restaurants and coffee shops, you've got banks and public libraries, uh, you know, that we're testing with, um, you know, you've got hair salons, you've got tech companies. So it's kind of really all walks of life within the community. And what we're kind of doing with it is, is we're using uh, the learnings coming out of this uh, data to, to really understand you know, how does this data benefit different sectors of the economy? You know, what are the opportunities for them? You know, what's the benefit to them in terms of having this data? So it's a really interesting project and we're really thankful for the government's uh, support in funding, you know, this and making it happen and um, excited to see what we learn from it too. So I think it'll be really interesting. And, you know, when we started, we thought, okay, this is, you know, we're going to go after kind of the retail sector or actually initially when we started, we were only in the cannabis industry. Um, and now here we are kind of experimenting with kind of all types of businesses and seeing the value that a platform like this can bring to multiple industry sectors. Um, and I think coupled with that, you know, part of the impetus for the government doing this is, is COVID uh, and kind of recovering and coming out of COVID. Uh, and how do they get the economy moving again? So kind of looking at this data and kind of what those movement patterns of people look like pre-COVID, you know, during lockdowns here, coming out of lockdowns, you know, how those patterns change. I think they're really interested in seeing that as well and figuring out, you know, how they can use that data to better focus where they're going to, you know, sort of invest economic stimulus money or, you know, supports to different industry sectors and things like that. Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations. Um, that's an exciting opportunity for ground level um, and just, you know, for the the country as a whole, right? Just the, the data and the insights that you guys are going to be bringing and providing. And um, I think it's super valuable. I, I think that having a better understanding of how do we, you know, hopeful like we're hopeful as human beings that these you know pandemics are not like one after the other and there's time but there's always you know things that that happen again so what can we learn from this so that we maybe can take that data and apply it to say like we can do better for this um, be more prepared be ready to to not have to shut everything down perhaps um, in the future um, so I think that this is like a, a great opportunity and it's just probably a very small uh, step in, in the you know great journey you guys are gonna take at ground level. So I'm excited to have a frontline seat there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm super excited about it. And, and, and I just see so much potential for it as we come out of this uh, pandemic and start to get things moving again. And, and, you know, and then of course we have our contact tracing um, data collection stuff too, which is, you know, mandated by the government here as well. So, you know, that's, that's been interesting to watch. Like we had, like we thought, okay, so just quickly on that. So here, all businesses, customer facing businesses, restaurants, retail, et cetera, you walk into these places here in Canada and you're pretty much required to provide your name, phone number, email address, and answer some symptom screening questions and stuff like that. And they have to keep a log, a record of this. And so many places were doing this on paper based systems, so like clipboards at the door. And we're like, this is crazy. So we built this little tool, QR code based, and we're kind of put it out there and we manage all the data and secure it and privacy and all that. Um, and we just put it out there. Uh, it's called Canatrace um, and we made it free. And we're, here we are like three months into this. We have 4,000 companies using this across the country today. Um, but like what's blown my mind is the diversity of businesses because it's not just customer facing anymore now we have like hundreds of companies using it for employee screening workplace safety type of stuff we yesterday we had the weirdest like coolest and weirdest thing so we got this call from a company in northern british columbia like up in the rocky mountains and they're like a trucking and transportation company that like you know basically you know trucks goods through the mountains uh, you know, on those treacherous climbs and, you know, snow covered, whatever, and all of that. And so they called us and they said, there's a, uh, a pulp and paper mill 
uh, up in northern BC, um, you know, where they make, you know, um, like take the trees and turn them into paper. Um, and they're like, it's been shut down. They're going to be reopening. And our company, our trucking company has been hired to transport the workers every day on shifts, like up, up and down the mountains into the, into the, where the mill is. And we need to screen every one of these workers every time they get on, you know, one of the trucks and get off one of the trucks. And we need to do that. And, and we, you know, we want to use the, the can trace tool to do that. And I was like, wow, like that's crazy, right? Like we thought here we are, we're helping all these restaurants and stuff. And here we are like trucking companies in the middle of the mountains, yeah. you know, taking workers to a pulp and paper, pulp and paper mill. Like that's, that's not anything I had envisioned. <laughs> so super cool. Um, yeah. And it's exciting. So very cool. Yeah. All right. Next. So next. speaking of, of using, you know, technology and location for, for good and help. Um, this is a really cool story from GTX Corp. So, you know, the shoe company GTX, uh, they have a product that they have released called GPS smart soul. So basically this looks like your, you know, standard orthotic or shoe insole, um, but it contains a tracker that makes use of, of IoT technology. So, you know, a phone or a, a, when you think about why you would want to be tracking people's shoes, let's just, you know, think about people with like dementia or um, maybe other concerns. And so they may forget like a phone or another type of device, but shoes uh, they say are rarely forgotten because it's part of their procedural memory. So it's like one of those um, you know, certain motor skills that you just don't really forget. And it's kind of uh, a process, right? Like before you leave the house, you put on your shoes. And so um, these smart souls, uh, they include this custom engineered circuit board and antenna and like firm, it's, it's firmware that they say is like actually military grade material, speaking of the military uh, grade <laughs> level. And so GTX embeds these, these sensors into these small units, and then they receive the information from GPS and communicate it to the GTX uh, platform, you know, that's on the, the company's servers so that users can, can log in via website and, and check and see like where their loved ones are. So the uh, interesting story um, behind this was that, you know, there was a, a New York boxer whose wife said that she's been using this for him. Um, his, I'm trying, I have, lost his name right now, but um, he, you know, he, he boxed in the sixties and seventies. It's Ray it's, and I'm, I'm going to butcher his last name, but it's with the C. Um, and so he was mental and getting a law passed into New York uh, state law in the 2010 concussion management awareness act. But he himself now suffers from a, a form of dementia, but he still really enjoys like being outdoors and hiking around his property and you know, obviously his wife wants him to be able to continue those things, but has a fear about him getting lost. So she uses this and kind of tracks him. And she's like, you know, he might, he might leave his coat, you know, for example, but now I can at least find him because he's likely not going to forget his shoes. Um, so I think that that is like an amazing, super, super cool uh, use of that. And another thing that GTX is working on is with uh, a partnership with Veristride Inc. And they make wearable devices uh, to sense a person's gait or like stride and how they walk. Um, so these biometric insoles have all these tiny sensors and they use AI and algorithms to, to just analyze how somebody walks and they can predict a fall. Um, so, you know, as a person moves their foot, they're sending all of this information and data to the transmitter um, that's tied to a smartphone app. And this information can obviously help people improve their their stride their gait so for example like amputees as they're they have to you know retrain and relearn how to walk with um you know as as they have you know just it's 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 very different obviously you're not going to just walk the same so it also can predict falls have uh, you know kind of gauge medication reaction um you know have an undetected stroke kind of uh detection and then early prediction of dementia, uh, dementia as well. So the Veristride technology they're hoping to uh, include into the Smart Soul platform and be tied to GTX's, um, you know, Internet of Things platform, which is really cool. So I love, I love this application. I think this is amazing. Um, you know, I think every, probably all of us know someone who has suffered from, you know, dementia or Alzheimer's, and you know, they 
generally people just want their freedom. They want to be able to not feel like they're being babysat all the time, even if, you know, they don't understand the repercussions of things and, and just being able to give them a little bit more life in this manner, I think is, is amazing. So I love this story. I think it's um, a great use of technology, a great use of location data. Um, yeah. So I, I think this is awesome. Good on GTX. Yeah, I think it's super cool. And, and, and I think anytime you can take these types of technologies and you can apply it for good and you can find ways to um, kind of leverage these technologies at low cost or, you know, that doesn't really, you know, significantly uh, increase, you know, sort of the, um, you know, the cost side to, to these types of, of customers that have, you know, whatever the ailment is or the issue. Uh, and you can kind of make it affordable and make it something that is adding real value and real utility to improving their situation. I think it's amazing, right? And, and uh, I remember as you were talking, I was looking up a, a story that we covered on on this podcast show back in 2013. Okay, so this is early, early days of the LBMA. Um, there was a company, it's still around, a company called Lechal, uh, L-E-C-H-A-L. And uh, these guys had developed shoes for visually impaired people. And so they basically had these shoes with uh, haptic sensors built into them, and you could use these to basically navigate around. And so, you know, just like when you have like, you know, sort of Google Maps on your phone and you're kind of following walking directions on that, instead of you, you know, looking down and seeing turn right now or whatever, there's a sensor inside the shoe that's basically going off, you know, uh, you know, and giving a signal to you as a visually impaired person to turn right now or stop or, you know, whatever, or, you know, what, whatever uh, to do next. And so that was 2013 that they were doing that and, um, you know, still building, you know, pretty interesting products that way. And so I love that these shoe companies, I love that these companies, you know, are able to kind of adapt and take technology and not just kind of, hey, build the next cool shoe for, you know, the, you know, the, uh, 16 year old out there, you know, that just wants to have cool shoes, but like to also find ways to make their products relevant and make their products uh, accessible, um, you know, to as many markets as, as possible. So, you know, I, I think I think this is such a good uh, use case, such a good story for GTX. And, um, you, you know, I, I think when I when I see things like this, I, I smile because like here in Canada, and I'm sure you guys in the States as well, you know, like from a web point of view, like an e-commerce point of view, there's so many laws and rules now here, you know, not just about privacy, but about accessibility. You have to build websites that, you know, are, can be used by, you know, hearing impaired, visually impaired, you know, all kinds of, you know, things like that. And, you know, we've kind of forced that upon, you know, the industry uh, from, you know, with some legal, um, you know, tools around that and, and controls. And I think it's, it, you know, in terms of commercial products like this, I think, you know, we could go a lot further to, you know, have these companies not just sort of do it because they think it's a good thing to do, which obviously these guys are doing and they're building some great solutions, but maybe we even have to go a step further and have, you know, more more rules and more sort of mandates on, on industry, you know, to develop products that, you know, are accessible to all. Um, you know, or available to all uh, in different ways. And, and I, I think there's way more to be done here, um, which is really interesting. And, uh, you know, whether, you know, and it's not, and I think it's not just physical uh, issues. I think there's other things too that, you know, we can address with these types of technologies, homelessness, poverty, you know, all kinds of other things. So um, that become really interesting. So I love these types of cause, you know, causes and finding ways to apply technology to them. Uh, I think it's, it's brilliant. So, yeah. yeah, you just reminded me that, um, you know, Nike recently released a shoe that was designed specifically for someone who had a, um, some type of like muscular dystrophy and it was very hard for them to tie their shoes. And so I, like before I even read the backstory on the shoe, I was like, oh, that's a cool shoe because they just kind of pop open and like you just slide it your foot in and, and yeah, and it just like yeah. closes. I was like, oh, that's great. Like I've, I'm thinking for me, like, oh, that's awesome because, you know, I'm always like running out the door with my kids. So I'm always like, what kind of shoe can I just like pop on really fast? Yeah. 
Um, but you know, it's great to see those too, right? Like the kids don't have to learn how to tie their shoes anymore. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not healthy. <laughs> uh, all right. Our final story. Um, now this, this one brings me way back. Like this has been an interesting show because we're like, we're kind of referencing these things from the past, but, mm -hmm. uh, way, way back in the very early days of the LBMA, when we started in 2009, at that time, around the same time, there was a company born called Gowalla. Uh, G-O-W-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. And these guys, you know, were fairly well known in the uh, location check-in, you know, uh, into places industry. They were kind of head-to-head competitors uh, with Foursquare back in the day. And then the kind of brand disappeared because in, in 2011, they were acquired by Facebook. And I remember these guys you know, A, because uh, there was an ardent, you know, following of Gowalla uh, and you were either a Gowalla user or a, or a Foursquare user. You typically weren't both. And I think the people who were Gowalla users were really, um, you, you know, really loved the platform and it was really well curated content and visuals and photography. And Josh Williams, the, the founder, you know, was, uh, you know, like posted such such great things. You know, I remember reading a lot of his stuff and seeing a lot of his photography at the time and, and whatnot. It was just cool. Um, and it was really like checking into cool places and, you know, travel logs and these kinds of things, uh, you know, more so than kind of the Foursquare use case of, you know, just checking into businesses and things like that, wherever he went. Um, but anyways, Facebook acquired these guys and they kind of went internal into the Facebook behemoth and, you know, I, I'm assuming worked on lots of Facebook's, you know, check-ins and, and location stuff. Um, but Goala itself is about to reemerge. Uh, so there's uh, news out there that uh, later this, this year, uh, they're going to come back out uh, as a um, geolocation platform focused on uh, AR uh, and delivering uh, augmented reality location specific experiences and lenses around businesses and points of interest. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it holds kind of true to the original uh, vision, but kind of brings in a modern update of augmented reality, which we know is, is really hot right now. Um, and they've raised $4 million in seed funding uh, to make this uh, happen from uh, GV Spark Capital Niantic, uh, the guys behind Pokemon, um, Upside Partnership, Otherwise Fund, Capital Factory. Um, you know, we know Capital Factory well, uh, given that we've hosted a lot of events there at South by Southwest. And Form Capital, and, and a number of angels. And perhaps the most notable angel of all that's involved in this is Dennis Crowley, the founder of Foursquare. So super interesting that what, you know, what, what was once the rivals of Josh and Dennis, uh, Foursquare, and, or Goala and Foursquare, uh, Dennis is now, um, you know, an angel investor in the rebirth of Goala. So I think this is incredibly, uh, you know, interesting. I think it, it's it's great to see this brand come back into our industry um, and, you know, attack it with, you know, a really hot uh, sort of place in the, in, in the industry with augmented reality. Um, you know, finding ways to gamify AR, I, I think, will be neat. There's a lot of competition, of course, um, you know, in this space uh, already. And um, it'll be interesting to see how they go about kind of building the user base and monetizing. Uh, Josh did in an interview recently say that uh, they're looking at revenue models where users might pay a flat fee of $49 a year to gain VIP memberships and have perks uh, that they'll access through, you know, a street team um type of approach uh, and private, you know, events and swag and, you know, things like that. So that could be interesting. Uh, obviously, Snapchat's heavy in this space with their AR lenses. You know, Pinterest is starting to do stuff in this space. Google's got their own lenses. You know, there's a lot of things going on um, and, and Pokemon itself. But, you know, this could be interesting where who knows, you, you know, you, you know, they grow this thing, you know, quickly scale it up. You know, maybe this becomes, a, you know, a, some kind of mashup with Pokemon Go or, you know, other parts of Niantic, you know, Red Rover Labs. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things, places this can go, but I'm just happy to see this brand come back. You know, I, I, I loved it back in the day and I think it's, uh, it, it's good to see it and good for, uh, for Josh and, and for our industry to, so, to show that people who were kind of at the, at the beginning of this industry are still in this industry and finding new ways to, uh, to make it happen. So, there you go.
Yeah, I think it's really, it is definitely like taking us back full circle for sure. To, to be talking about this company, but I do think there's an opportunity, even though it is getting to be a crowded space. Like I think we've had, you know, probably four stories or so just in the past 25 episodes, um, you know, where we've been talking about the different lenses and uh, the AR, you know, being brought together with content and just the different capabilities that are being added in, you know, inclusive of Snap and, and other big companies that already have a pretty big foothold there. But what I think is it, there is an opportunity for is likely maybe more of a B2B play, right? So um, enabling companies with your technology and just allowing them to use that and plug that in whenever they want to, whether that's for, you know, something like Pokemon and 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 more of like a, a gamification a application, or if it's for, you know, content and history or culture, you know, or just you know, having that, those offerings, there's a lot of companies that don't have uh, uh, the capacity to build this type of technology. And so there's likely uh, an opportunity there as well, because we know that Snap's likely not going to be licensing out their, their uh, data and platforms to be used by other businesses. So um, I think this is, this is interesting. It's one to watch for sure. Definitely. Definitely. So yeah, congrats to, to Josh and, and the team for, you know, bringing that back to life and, and, and giving it some new, uh, some new vision and some new mission and, and on the funding to make it happen too. So, uh, that's super exciting. All right. Well, that's our show for this week. Uh, you've been listening and watching episode number 505 of Location Weekly. We thank you for your time. Uh, we thank you for uh, your encouragement. Please reach out to us, uh, give us some feedback. If you have story ideas, we want to hear about those too. Um, and uh, yeah, um, we'll see you next week for uh, 506, but uh, have a great week, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye.